Um, I'm Fantasai. I have been working on the specs for a long time. Uh, I'm an invited expert in the CSS working group. So that means I'm not representing any company. Um, and I've been, but with the initial reason I was brought onto the CSS working group was partly because of expertise in internationalization. So we're going to talk about internationalization today. I'm going to give you basically a very rapid crash course in web internationalization in 18 minutes. <laughs> So first off, um, what is internationalization? It's the process of enabling software to support multiple languages and locales. Um, back in the 80s and 90s, this was an extremely painful process. You had to do a separate kind of release for each software. But with the web platform, we have a platform that can handle every language and every writing system. Um, some better and some worse, but it's a global s platform that you can write to, which is amazing. I wanted to talk a little bit about, before we get to styling, about what translation and localization is. Um, they're not the same thing. Uh, translation is just taking some text and converting it to a different language. Localization is also going to deal, is, is sometimes involves translation and sometimes doesn't. Like if you're, you might um, have a web page that is a website that works in Canada and the US, and you're not really going to translate it, but you might have to deal with some other things because of conventions in currency and my dates and times and numbers and other things like that. So localization involves changing the language, but also currency and payment systems, ad adapting to different laws, dealing with geography, knowing that it's you're not going to have a summer sale in Australia in July, and um, dealing with other aspects of culture, like uh, changing your marketing campaign. If you're going to market in France, you're going to do something maybe slightly different than you would in um, Quebec. So as a result, uh, you want to, when you're making a, a website that works in multiple locales, you will need to make translations often. Um, but you should also consider that translation and locale are not the same thing. There are Chinese-speaking people in America, and there are English-speaking spe speaking people in China. And so uh, there's no real reason to limit your translation to a particular locale unless the content is tied to, a, in that language, is very tied to the locale. Um, and so uh, you should always give your users an explicit choice in terms of which language they want to read your website in, if you have that choice available. Um, and you can also use um, con content negotiation using the uh, browser's request language headers, which will tell you what language the user wants to see the website in, uh, whether they are currently traveling or they are using a different operating system than the languages that they speak, which could be a larger set than the OS language. Um, so while I'm here, I'm going to plug UTF-8. Use UTF-8 for everything, always, every language. Um, and so now we get to styling. <laughs> there are three major areas of style where styling and writing systems and language come into in interact. One of them is the very obvious typography. Another one is bidirectionality, which um, has effects both at the text and at the layout level. And then another one that's somewhat underappreciated is sizing. So the first thing you want to do for good typography is actually declare the language. There are a lot of subtle things that uh, CSS will do with knowledge of the language. It includes there's changes to how we do line breaking, the hyphenation dictionary that we use for hyphenation. Certain fonts support different languages. So, uh, conventions about glyph shapes. So for example, a Cyrillic font that supports all of, the language, all of the languages that use Cyrillic will have slightly different shapes depending on the language, and we will trigger those automatically if you have tagged the language to the content. The underlying position varies, um, especially in vertical writing, and the position of Ruby annotations, which is an annotation system used frequently in East Asia. Um, so sometimes you want something that's not automatically done, actually very frequently. Um, and for that, we have language-based selectors. Uh, these will let you check on the language. Now, the lang attribute, you can use an attribute selector to check that, but it will not work on a child of the element on which you have set the lang attribute, but the lang selector will because it checks the inherited value. And also, the lang selector can do certain kinds of wildcard matching and um, is a little bit more powerful in how it matches the language. Uh, so, bidirectionality. Um, sometimes you might be 
changing, remarking with languages that work right in different directions. So, for example, Hebrew and Arabic are, and Farsi are written from right to left on a page rather than left to right. Um, and somehow we have to deal with that. And the way we deal with that is using code for Baidai. Um, here's an example of some text that is mixing two different languages. And you can see that the content starts from left to right, but there's a phrase in there, that's my name in, in, far, in uh, the Arabic script, is going from right to left. And there is also the case, even if you're staying within one of these right to left languages and you're not even considering the mixing of languages or inserting people's names or whatever, you still have to deal with Baidai because numbers are always left to right, even Arabic numbers. So the way we deal with this in the web platform is we use the Unicode bidirectional algorithm. And its job is to take your text and order it correctly. Um, the text is stored in logical order, so that's the order you read it in, it's not in a kind of like a visual order. The reason we do that is because the order is also kind of dependent on where you break. If you notice in this example, um, my first name comes first, which is on the right side, but it has to be the first line. So if I break between the first and last names, I need to make sure that my first name stays on the first line and my last name goes on the second line. Um, so the way the by algorithm works is it classifies neutrals and then it figures out what are contiguous runs of the same direction of character and then it reorders them and it just flips the runs over. Uh, neutrals, so neutrals are characters like punctuation. So all characters in Unicode have some kind of uh, intrinsic directionality to them. Um, there's a strong left to right characters like Latin and Chinese. Um, strong right to left characters like Arabic and Hebrew. And then there's neutral characters, spaces and punctuation, symbols, emoji, these are all neutral characters. So um, the first thing that we do is we have to have everything has to be, have a directionality before we can calculate our runs. So first we have to figure out what all the neutrals are. And the way we do that is using the sandwich rule, which is if you're between two strong characters that are match, then you are that kind of character. Um, but sometimes that doesn't work because maybe you are between two different kinds of characters. Or you're at the start or end of the paragraph. And to deal with that case, we use the base direction of the paragraph. The paragraph has an in inherent directionality, an overarching like directionality goal, and that's how we resolve it. So depending on the base direction, we'll resolve these neutrals to either left to right or right to left. Um, if you have the wrong base direction, then sometimes your punctuation ends up weird, your text might actually end up in the wrong order, and it's not good. So we need to find the base direction. Um, the way we do it, you have to declare that actually explicitly, um, because we can't magically detect sometimes people write in a mix of Latin letters and Arabic, because they're talking a lot of CSS acronyms and properties, so you can't just be like, well, which character are there more of? That doesn't work. So you have to declare your doc directionality on Arabic and Hebrew documents. You do that with the HTML dir attribute. You do not do that with CSS direction property, uh, which should never have existed. Um, and there's, <laughs> there's a number of reasons why, which you can read about in the writing mode spec, but um, don't do that. Um, direction de defaults to LTR, so you only really have to set it when you're dealing with right to left text. Um, and it inherits through the tree, so you only have to set it at the top or wherever there's a change in direction. Um, and elements with the dir attribute create an isolation. Um, what that means is that the content inside an isolation is not affected by content outside it. So, um, for example, all that, you know, uh, the characters near me are this kind of character, so my neutrals resolve none of the, you can't see anything outside of your isolation. So you think you're at the end of the paragraph. And you also, the stuff outside isn't affected by the inside. So it sees basically, uh, there's a neutral character here, is what it sees. And so it is not going to be influenced by whatever content you put inside the isolation. Um, and this is really important when you have user input. So you want to isolate all of your user input. You want to isolate any kind of number punctuation sequences because uh, they might end up flipping directions depending on what characters are around them. And uh, you also want to trip, strip any trailing spaces in your elements because sometimes if they flip around, you end up with two spaces on one side and none on the other. Um, Sometimes you don't know the directionality of your content. This is very frequently the case when you have user input or data generated from some kind of database. 
And to help you with that, there is an auto value for dir. Um, and there's a BDI element, which stands for bidirectional isolation. Um, and the BDI element is just like a span, except it automatically has dir equals auto. Um, what it does is it direct detects the direction of the paragraph from the first strong character. So skipping all the neutrals, which is, the, do we have left to right or right to left? But this is a really kind of dumb heuristic. It doesn't always work. However, it is very controllable, so it's easy to manipulate. Um, if you have better info than the first strong character, we strongly encourage you to just use that rather than relying on this heuristic in the browser. Um, and then the direction not only affects text content, but it also impacts layout in CSS. Um, it affects the default alignment, so right to left characters are aligned to the right rather than to the left by default. Um, it affects the ordering of columns and tables, multi-column, grid, flex, whatever layout system we have is gonna be sensitive to direction by default. Um, it affects the scrolling direction, um, and it affects the, obviously, ordering of the text. So to help kind of write pages that work easily in both right to left and left to right contexts, we have uh, logical properties and values. So you're familiar with text align left. We also have a value text align start. Uh, this is the initial value that the user agent uses. That's why Hebrew pages aren't broken by default um, when you load up a HTML page in Hebrew. Um, there are also some new properties which are analogs of existing properties that use the logical direction. So for margin left and margin right, we have margin inline start and margin inline end. Um, your lists in the user agent default style sheet are styled with margin inline start for the indentation. Um, we have a whole bunch of them the dealing with sizing and the different sides of the box and these logical properties actually like, are abstract enough to deal with vertical text as well, so if you are working in a vertical writing mode, then you have, you can, those directions will translate and margin inline start will indent from the top instead of from the left in vertical Japanese. Um, we also have directionality-based selectors, so if you need to do some additional tweaking and you don't have the tools that you need just yet, um, you can select based on the directionality, and that's the resolved directionality, so auto goes away and becomes one of these two. Um, and so that brings us to some other aspects you might want to deal with, have to deal with as languages change or sizing related stuff. Um, so at a typographic level, there you have to deal with the fact that the density of characters varies a bit, and so the most readable, smallest font size is gonna be a little different in certain writing systems versus others. And then uh, stacking how tall the characters get varies. In English, we have almost no accents. And so you can get, with much, get away with a much tighter line spacing. But in Vietnamese, you stack a lot of accents above and below the characters. And so you would need a little bit more space above and below them to accommodate the text. Um, the other fun thing is that the length of the content varies a lot. Uh, French is particularly long, and Chinese is exceptionally compact. And so if you're translating your pages you might, and you're using fixed sizes anywhere, you might notice that they're not quite the right size anymore. Um, and the way to deal with this is to take advantage of intrinsic sizing. Uh, this is something that CSS and web layout has done for a long time, and we have much more powerful tools to control it today with flex and grid. Uh, but your number one tool is the auto keyword, which um, tries to f negotiate between the, narrow, the smallest unbreakable object, and, uh, sorry, the largest unbreakable object and the smallest size it can get without wrapping, and tries to basically fit the content. And you can also explicitly request the min content or max content sizes um, through keywords on width and, height, width and height and in the grid uh, template properties. So here's an example of what intrinsic sizing means. This is a graphic design poster by Jan Tichol, and um, Jen Simmons took this and turned it into CSS, where you can see that the relationship has kind of stayed the same among the various elements of the page, but it's resizable, unlike the original. And you can see that it maintains those relationships. What are those relationships? Well, we've got this box here is the max content. It's the same length as the name guy's, this guy's name. This overlap is the same size as here. And then we've got 
this additional flexible space that stretches to fill the page. And this box is as wide as this like, longest word here. So when we translate this page to Chinese, and this is an automatic translation, so don't try to read it, but um, <laughs> it still maintains those relationships. And it still kind of has that same feeling. And everything kind of matches up. And I did it because I used these content-based sizing rather than trying to pick the fixed size that happens to work for that font, that language, that bit of text. Um, so these are the tools we've got for you in CSS. Um, we encourage you to use them. We're adding more. As you know, that you might have noticed that like Flex and Grid use these funny start and end keywords. and like. They don't talk about horizontal and vertical alignment. And that's because we've abstracted them out so that they work for all the writing systems and they automatically adapt to the writing directions that you have. Um, and we're adding more logical properties and trying to improve the Dur and Lang selectors to be more powerful over time. So, um, and if you want to learn more about internationalization, the W3C has an internationalization working group. They publish a lot of really cool articles about like, things like what's in a name and how names vary across the different regions and how to use the Baidai codes and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, you can also get involved in internationalization for the web platform by contributing to the internationalization group, any expertise you have on adapting things to writing systems and what's missing in the web platform to make um, layout work for that language. This is a list of existing task forces. If you have any expertise in these areas for typesetting, we would love to ask you questions. And that's it for today. Thank you.